Dave, nice to see you. Hi, John. Good to see you. That was a wild football game on Friday. That was a wild one. It really was, especially I mean, since could, I couldn't could, see most could you, of the game. Could you? I was. I, I was going to ask you how you saw it. it was, I mean, welcome everybody. Oh. I'm Lindsay, <laughs> and I'm part of the client relations team here at the San Francisco Giants. I wanted to be the first to welcome you all to the return of our Chalk Talk series with our Giants broadcasters. With the holiday season upon us, we sincerely hope that everyone is healthy and well. As we prepare for the new season of Giants baseball, we have been in contact with many of our customers and we know that in addition to the team on the field, the health and safety protocols that will be in place at Oracle Park are a main concern. We are currently working on those plans and coordinating with Major League Baseball, local and state public health officials, and we actually anticipate having more information after the first of the year. Tonight, however, we're here to talk about baseball as the winter meetings are on our horizon. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave Fleming. Dave? Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, sorry, everybody, I was talking right over Lindsay as she started. We were just chit-chatting because we get to see each other. Yeah. Dave Fleming, Dwayne Kuiper, Mike Kruko, John Miller. We have Farhan. We have Scott Harris. We have uh, Gabe Kapler joining us as well. But you and uh, the four of us get uh, a few minutes to just say hi. How's everybody doing? Well, we're doing good. It's uh, There's no snow up here in Reno, so uh, the weather's been unbelievable. Every time I try to call uh, Dwayne, he's on the golf course. Uh, if I try to call John, he's taking a seven-mile walk into Half Moon Bay. And Dave... I can't even track you down. You're all over the country. <laughs> At least you're in your basement. Well, all over the country, sitting right in the same spot, doing all my. I see. I put you guys on my TV backdrop. We like that. Yeah, you got well, a lot of airtime. There's a uh, no snow in Danville, so that's good. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I played a little bit of golf, but but not very well. Uh, you know, I, I was telling my wife the other day, every day seems like Wednesday, except for Sundays when there's a lot of, obviously, NFL football on. And I know, Dave, for you, there's college basketball and college football. But for us folks that aren't working, it's Wednesdays is, is every day. Uh, <laughs> and because it's the same, you know, it's like, well, should I go to the grocery store today or should I not? And that's it. So, but... We're healthy. We're happy. Uh, you know, let's all get the vaccine soon and let's play ball. No kidding. John, how I mean, are this, you? This is usually the time of year when ever since I was a, a, a kid, it, for me, there was the giant season and then the off season. And I could listen to the 49ers or watch the 49ers. And then the Warriors came on and whatnot. Where are the Warriors? Uh, I'm supposed to be <laughs> watching Steph Curry right now, aren't I? Where are they? So uh, it, it is, it's kind of weird, but uh, uh, I, I miss it. And, and, but it is great to see you guys. And I think about you all the time and, uh, and, you know, we're, we're kind of hungry for some baseball information. And uh, I, I know there's, there've been some things happening. The giants have made some, some uh, little sort of below the radar kind of moves to opening up some spots in the 40 man roster and whatnot, which kind of makes you think that, Maybe some things could be happening, and uh, uh, then there's some guys who were non-tendered. Some some pretty good names who got non-tendered. I know you guys saw that. So uh, 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 this seems like a perfect time to get into it with guys like Farhan and, and Scott Harris to find out uh, what's going on. If the the Giants might be linked up with any of those guys who are newly available. It's a we're, we're going to ask those questions, I promise. And it is it is a cool time of year because I do think now we're going to start to get some actual baseball news. You you guys spent any time? I mean, we've had now several months, but uh, since we're talking to our season ticket members who we missed at the actual ballpark this year, we didn't get to interact with any of them in person like we usually do during the season. Any time to decompress and think about 2020 and how the actual season went? You you know you've been Thinking back to how it all unfolded. Go ahead, Mike. Well, yeah, you know, and it, it was such an enjoyable season, and it ended. Nobody ever thought that we were even going to have an opportunity to see the Giants get to the playoffs, and then when it all ended, we felt like, man, they should have been there, you know. So there was some pain to this this season. When if you'd have told me there was a chance for pain, I would have said, "Give it, bring it on." 
but everybody that I've talked to up here in Reno, they were stoked. They loved it. They loved the attitude of, of what they watched all summer or the lace the, the, for the 60 game schedule. And uh, they were, they were completely excited about the offense. They haven't been able to talk about offense for a long time. So, you know, it was, it was a, it was a, it was a success. They didn't get to the playoffs, but you know what? They won some hearts. And I think that was important. Yeah. You know, we were talking before this started with Mario Eliotto and he was saying that, you know, we need fans, we need people in the park. And really all we did was talk to cardboard cutouts. And in a lot of ways that's true, but in some ways you and, and John, you guys spoke to a lot of people on the radio for 60 games. And Mike and I spoke to a lot of people on TV for 60 games. And we enjoyed it immensely. Uh, in such an odd way, it was about as much fun as you could possibly have. It really was. Uh, you know, the only thing that we missed is having dinner together before the games. Uh, or actually being in the same booth to do the post-game wrap. Because uh, we were all separated in our own booths. And, and uh, Darren Chan made it perfectly normal for us to do it the way we did it. But the really fun things that we like about going to the ballpark is being able to go on the field and being able to be with each other. And that's the one thing that we didn't get to do. Well, yeah. it, it, it was bizarre, that's for sure. And, uh, and when you talk about the fans not being there, we miss them so, so much. But... And that final game, we talked about it on the post-game wrap because you guys on television, you showed a lot of shots of the huge crowd that was out there in McCovey Cove that day. It was a beautiful day. And it was a pennant race, and they were there. It looked like one of those World Series games where the, the, an armada was gathered, and you couldn't find any room out there in the cove. So during one of Dave's innings, I went down there to the right field corner on the club level just to see it for myself. And they were doing cheers. They were doing let's go Giants cheers. A guy got a base hit and this big ovation went up from boat to boat, kayak to kayak. And uh, uh, so that was just really exciting it, to hear the crowd actually there and actually rooting for the Giants. And they had to have the game on TV or on radio or on the app or whatever to know what was even going on. Uh, so they were, they were there. We knew they were, they were there. And, uh, so that, that's part of the excitement. Now, this uh, uh, vaccine may be here soon. We don't know uh, when it's going to be widely available. Uh, we don't know when spring training is going to start. We know when it's supposed to start. We know when the season is supposed to start, right around the 1st of April. Uh, we don't know when it's going to start. Uh, but we're hoping to see some people in the ballpark when it does get started. And maybe those are some things that uh, that Farhan and, and Scott Harris might know a little bit about. So, uh, although I think every, everything's just speculation right now, because uh, even the, the people at the very top in the commissioner's office, uh, they don't know what the situation is going to be like then. I'm sure they have all kinds of contingency plans for what they're going to do. Uh, but meanwhile, the, the process of putting the team together uh, continues. And based on what we saw with the offense, I mean, how many times did they make big comebacks in games it was just so exciting to see him hit so well and to see some of the veteran guys who'd had down years uh come back in in a big way so uh, uh the uh, and, and i guess some of that was uh the work that they put in and maybe the the approach that uh, and, and in some cases a new approach with the hitting coaches and, and whatnot uh whatever it was it, it was so fun to see and just Fremsky, uh he came back his first full year, although it was, it was 60 games, but he was in the MVP running for a good long while. So, uh, so that was exciting to see that, that he really looks for real, that he's legitimate. So uh, they, they really scored big time with him. You know, and I have thought, I, I don't know if you guys have done the same. I should be over it. It's December 3rd, but I've thought about that last game a lot since it happened. And I think we said it after the game, it was almost cruel because to me, one of the themes of the year was the Giants just had terrific at-bats, basically from game one all the way through game 60. And not that we hadn't seen that before, but I, the consistency of everybody sort of grinding out at-bats, controlling the strike zone, making pitchers work, all the stuff we saw 
up and down the lineup this last year. And then that last game, Austin Slater and others did exactly what he'd done the whole year. And it just felt like on the day where they had to have that game, they didn't get rewarded for that. And that, I mean, it just felt cruel to me because it was, in a way, it emphasized all the great improvements that the Giants offense made all season. But I'm over it. I'm not thinking about it anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm over fine. it too. <laughs> a lot of therapy, uh, well, I got to tell you. A lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> should we uh, should we welcome in uh, Farhan and Scott and uh, get down to business and start talking some 2021 Giants baseball? Bring him in. You bet. Yeah, let's see if they can. Uh, oh, there he is. Hi, Farhan. Hey. Hi, Scott. Scott, you can. Hey, guys. You are going to talk. Yeah. Good, Good to see you. How you both doing? We're doing We're okay. We're, um, you know, it was a little bit of a busy day for us yesterday with the tender deadline. And so we had some activity there. And as you guys kind of mentioned, it, it's been a little bit of a slow off season so far, but the virtual winter meetings are coming up. The rule five draft is coming up. We've seen a couple of major league signings happen. And, you know, I think the momentum of the off season is going to start picking up here. So it should be an exciting few weeks. Have you completed okay. your therapy after the last game? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it, it's funny. It, 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 it's one of those things that feels like just yesterday, but it also feels like so long ago. And, uh, you know, we've gotten so busy with preparing uh, for the off season and, uh, next year, but I did have a moment today where, uh, you know, how close we got hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, um, you kind of have those moments where you're like, man, <laughs> we were so close. And, uh, you know, I, we're just really happy to be on um, with our, our really valued season ticket holders, happy to be with everybody. And, you know, I know I speak on behalf of, uh, you know, the whole organization when I say we really wanted it for our fans because it's been a tough year for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly for our city, the Bay Area. And, you know, we really felt the support of our fans, even though they couldn't be in the ballpark with us. Um, so that was that was the toughest part of it. You know, I will say watching, you know, when uh, the wild card round started, I, I turned on, you know, the Dodgers Brewers game one and I could only watch about 15 seconds of it before I had to shut it off because it just felt like that should be us. We should be there, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I know the Dodgers didn't didn't want to be playing us either. So, uh, you know, we were we were a team that I think people viewed as being pretty dangerous if we were able to get in. So. Um, but you know what, that's going to make it all the, all the sweeter when, when we do get in the door and we're really looking forward to next year. And hopefully that'll be the year for us. The, the hey, one thing John, I you want to go ahead, Scott, the go one ahead. thing I'll add from that is I just had a flashback now that you reminded me of how the, the season ended. Uh, the majority of the cutouts in the ballpark are cheering. And so right after, uh, our season ended and we just missed the playoffs, I walked down to the clubhouse and I walked by hundreds of cutouts that are still cheering. And, uh, it was really, really hard to look at them, but I appreciate the resilience of all the fans staying, staying positive, even in the cruelest of circumstances. I think our, you know, one thing that I, you know, especially for Scott Farhan, this was your second year. So you have had a chance to be around the city and interact with Giants fan Scott this was your first year with us I do feel for you in a way because I think one of the coolest parts of your job would be to be in San Francisco be in Northern California be around Giants fans have you had a chance to get any of that sort of feedback of hey welcome to the town welcome have you had any part of that experience not really I mean I got a taste of it in Scottsdale before we we shut down uh but I would be lying if I if I said I didn't, you know, uh, at times during the season when I'm sitting behind the plate between two cardboard cutouts, see a great play or a Yaz walk off or something and try to turn to the person next to me and talk about it and realize that it's just a piece <laughs> of cardboard. So um, needless to say, I'm really excited for the fans to be back and to, to start interacting with everyone at Oracle. Well, you've we, been we here do for have a whole a... year now. You've been wearing your mask. They still don't know who the general manager looks like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have a long list of uh, season ticket uh, member submitted questions. So I do want to get to as many of those as I can. But I thought maybe Kipe or John, if you wanted to, to jump in and ask a question before we start going through some of these. Uh, 
who wants to go for Kipe? You want to you want to throw something out there? I do. Uh, within the last couple of weeks, Mike and I each got a phone call from Pat Burrell, and uh, and for whatever reason, he just needed to talk about what he saw in Arizona this fall with the two teams that the Giants had. And Pat Burrell's not a guy that dishes out compliments. He's just an old school guy that that kind of thinks everybody sucks, right? <laughs> Except him. <laughs> uh, but, but basically his, his speech to Mike and I was, they are coming, guys. There's eight or nine or ten guys that are coming. And within the next couple of years, he said, you're really going to be shocked at what's coming. So I, I, I guess it's more of a statement than a question to Farhan and to Scott this has got to be good news for you guys. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, Scott actually got down to Arizona and, and, and saw those guys in person. So I'll, I'll defer to him on that, but you know, we are really excited and we've talked a lot about how our goal is, you know, to build an exciting and competitive team in the present, uh, but also look to the future and what the giants can be. So you know, the fact that we had a competitive season and then we got to see some of these kids really light things up in Arizona, you know, and got great feedback even from other organizations about what was happening there. Uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. I'll, I'll Scott, you want to give us any you want to give us any specifics of what you saw down there? Yeah, absolutely. I um, as, as Farhan alluded to, some of the most valuable uh, feedback you can get in this industry is. Uh, are compliments from other teams about your players. And uh, that was one of my takeaways from going down to Arizona and watching the kids play and instructs is, you know, you'd go to, um, you know, play the Cubs, you go play the Brewers, you go play some of these other teams. And afterwards, you know, the GM or assistant GM or farm director would come and grab you and say, Hey, who, who is that kid? Or man, I, we misevaluated this guy in the draft. Like he's, he's a lot better than we thought we were, or man, what'd you do? what did you do with this hitter to, to help him develop that approach? And, um, that was what was really exciting to me, um, uh, in addition to the quality of, of the work w we saw down there. Um, but a couple of names that, that stuck out to me uh, down there were, were Kyle Harrison, who's a local kid, um, a left-handed starter from De La Salle, who, who we got in the draft. Um, you know, he was, he was up to 97 and he was landing all three pitches for strikes and just dominating some young hitters at, in instructs. And that was really fun to watch. And then um, a couple of high upside position players that we're really excited about are, are Luis Matos and uh, Marco Luciano, who um, really had tremendous uh, instructional league performances. And, and in, in Luciano's case, the thing that was most impressive to me was watching the adjustments he made from the alternate site in Sacramento to, uh, to the instructional league in, in Arizona. We really challenged him and, and asked him to face upper level pitching, you know, guys that were you know, recently in the big leagues who were optioned down to, to Sacramento. And, and that was the first time that he really faced um, pitching at the intersection of command and stuff. And so those pitchers were able to exploit his weaknesses and, and, and it taught him how to um, identify those weaknesses, how to make adjustments to his approach and his swing and, um, and still perform. And, and that was the most exciting part about, um, you know, watching him play in instructs. Yeah, I've heard some. Would, I've heard some very high praise about him from around the game. Very high praise. Go ahead, Farhan. Yeah, I was just going to add uh, to Scott's report on instructs. You know, one of the big developments for us was having three of our young pitchers, young right-handed relievers, really light things up in Camilo Duvall, Gregory Santos, and Kirvin Castro. And John referenced some of the forty-man uh, sort of. Uh, moves that we have had to make over the last few days. And a lot of that was to accommodate those guys on the 40 man roster. It was interesting. Instructional league was the first time that scouts were allowed back into stadium ballparks to watch these guys play. And, um, you know, I guess in some sense it was to our detriment that we had all these guys lighting up the radar guns in front of these scouts. And so guys that, you know, hadn't pitched above a ball suddenly, uh, um, you know, we're, we're getting these scouts pretty excited and we wound up having to add them to our roster. But, you know, three guys that were touching 100 with good secondary stuff um, and, you know, relievers can move really quickly. And that's obviously a need for ours of ours. So, um, you know, we'll see if those guys can make an impact for us, um, you know, next year or the year after. But really excited about some of those young arms that are going to fill out our bullpen as well. Mike, did you raise your hand? 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I emphasize what Pat Brill said. I mean, he was so excited. And I don't think I've ever heard him talk about arms. And he said there were seven guys down there are going to be big leaguers. I thought that was really kind of cool. But given that you've had all this this progress in the minor league system and you've had all these these players develop and you've brought new players in where now, you know, you're ranked in the top 10 10 and some uh, ranking uh, have you in the top five. But my question is, are you concerned about a rule five situation? Because the rule five draft is now not that far away and you've got guys down there that organizations want. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the reason we were more aggressive protecting guys. We added, um, you know, five guys to the roster. And, and that was a big reason for it. Uh, you know, usually, a, a you know, pitcher who hasn't pitched above a ball, you might kind of take your chances with them. But, um, you know, in this scenario uh, where, you know, scouts were kind of back at it, and I think it's going to be a pretty active rule five draft because, um, you know, the looks that scouts got at these guys in instructional league are going to be fresh in everybody's mind. But, you know, again, one of the things we're most excited about, you know, speaking more generally about where we are as an organization is, you know, when we're able to pick up a guy like a Yaz or a uh, Alex Dickerson or Donovan Solano without dipping into that farm system, you know, and those are guys that can, you know, help us compete and, and help us create an exciting club at the major league level and, and know that we have that next wave coming. That's really what, um, you know, our goal has been. And, and so we're excited about the progress that those guys are making down there, but also excited about what we have going on at the big league level. All right, let me, uh, John, before you jump in, let me ask, because Tim Malone, uh, one of our season ticket members from 129, uh, asked about the minor leagues. And so he hit, part of his question was strengths and weaknesses. Is there, a, is there a part of the organization overall that you all are still focusing on to get better to strengthen how would you answer tim's question yeah i would um i would say our system um and and again focusing just on the farm system right now i think it's a little bit imbalanced i think we're we're very self-aware about that um i think we have more high upside position playing prospects than arms right now but um as we just discussed instructional league was a huge development for us um we place an emphasis on trying to replenish uh, the pipeline of arms in the draft and, um, and through international free agency. And a lot of those arms took a, a big step forward in instructs. Um, you know, we talked about Santos, we talked about Castro, we talked about Harrison, a guy um, named Tristan Beck, who is a local kid who went to Stanford, um, made a huge strides in instructs. And, and he's a player that we acquired um, last year from, from the Braves at the, the trade deadline. So, I think we're focused on replenishing the pipeline of arms in this organization because this organization has a long history of homegrown front of the rotation starters. And that's why uh, this organization uh, has such a decorated history of winning. And we know that we have to um, replicate that if we're going to uh, get to where we want to go as an organization. John, you want to jump in before I get to some more season ticket questions? Yeah. The, the one thing I wanted to just follow up on was, uh, with some of these guys who were non-tendered, uh, number one, were you surprised by some of the names that came out, like uh, uh, David Dahl, who was an all-star the year before last, uh, and he's had some injury problems with the Rockies. Uh, Kyle Schwarber, who hit, what, 38 home runs uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, both guys who have had some success at the big league level, and there were some other names as well that were out there. Uh, so, number one, were you surprised about that? And are, are there some, some guys who've come available as a result of this, these non-tenders, that maybe the Giants will be interested in? Yeah, it, it was, you know, we had an eventful evening, not just kind of going through our, our list of players and, and getting a lot of deals done that we were happy about, but certainly looking through that non-tender list. And, you know, I, I think front offices are, are prone to a little bit of a bias that, you know, when you have your own player, sometimes – you're maybe too critical or you're too aware of, you know, what their shortcomings or faults might be. Um, and then those guys get out into the open market and they do even better than they would have done if you had kept them. So uh, I do think there's some interesting names and, you know, certainly some of the players on that list had health issues or, or other issues that led to them being non-tendered. A lot of the players that were non-tendered, uh, their, um, you know, former teams are, are interested in retaining, but it, it definitely added, um, you know, a level of activity to, you know, what was already happening in free agency. There's 
certainly more players out there, more movement, and, and we made calls on quite a few guys last, last night. Okay, uh, good segue to, I'm going to double up a few of these questions because we have a lot of them. Bonnie Garcia-Morla, who's in Section 124, Michael Spitek from 319, Joseph and Arsenia from uh, 310. Areas of focus for improvement, I, I mean, I'm assuming big league team, for 2021, what do you what do you most need to to work on from now until the start of the year? Scott, you want to take that one? Sure. I uh, first would like to remind everyone um, we're getting some reinforcements without having to negotiate any contracts or make any trades. So I think our first priority is just to reintroduce uh, Tyler Beatty, Reyes Maranta, and um, and this catcher named Buster Posey who we get back, which is going to be really <laughs> exciting for us. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, you know, as we go into this offseason and as we start to address our weaknesses, it's important that that we stay mindful of the guys we're getting back and, and the track records they have and the performance that, that we can count on from them in 2021. I think beyond that, uh, we went into the winter uh, focused on addressing our rotation. I, I think we found um, – uh, significant value in, in Drew Smiley and Kevin Gossman and Tyler Anderson last year when we tried to address our rotation and we're coming into this winter trying to do it again and and um, we just uh, took a huge step in that direction by getting Kevin Gossman back um, for 2021 which we're really excited about because we think he took a, a huge step forward and his ability to command his four seam up and, and also to command his split down below the zone because we know that's a huge pitch for him and and uh, the development strides he made during the 2020 season, um, we feel like are going to, um, you know, bleed into 2021 and beyond. And we think he's going to be a huge part of our rotation. Um, beyond the rotation, I think we're, we're looking for some veteran uh, relievers to complement some of the young guys that we have in our pen. I think 2020 was a huge year for us in that we battle tested a lot of young arms and put them in very difficult situations in the eighth inning of a tie game or in a safe situation. And um, they, for many of them, it was a sink or swim moment uh, for, for them. And, and I think as you know, you watch the evolution of our bullpen last year, uh, you saw that it, it became a high performing unit by the end of the year. I think, you know, from mid August to the end of the year, we had the best bullpen ERA in, in baseball, which is a testament to the adjustments that they made during the season and the maturity that many of those inexperienced relievers uh, found throughout the season. And so I think we're looking to supplement that core with, with some veteran relievers and um, the offensively, I would say the one need for us is, is to try to find a left-handed versatile um, bat that can really help uh, balance our lineup a little more and, and play a variety of positions. Cause we know that cap is, is never going to hesitate to um, get our best bats in the lineup against any favorable matchup. And so we want to give him as many options as possible to, uh, to put out the most formidable lineup that, that he can every night. Did you guys, Gabe is going to join us here in a few minutes. Uh, did you, what did you think of Gabe in his first year as Giants manager? You can, you can say he's not listening. He's not. <laughs> well, you know, I, I thought it was really cool to see him get manager of the year consideration, uh, which I thought was really well-deserved for, you know, including from a couple of our local writers. And then I, I think you may have gotten a vote from writer outside of the Bay Area, but I actually think even the votes from the Bay Area are probably more meaningful because I think those writers recognize um, not just the challenges that him and his staff faced, but, um, you know, the results that we were able to get and really how close we came to a playoff berth, which was pretty unexpected. So, uh, you know, I think what we are most enthusiastic about is, you know, first the job that, you know, he's done as a, a leader, putting together a staff, the connections he's made, not just in the organization, but um, in the community. Um, and then, you know, his own growth and, and, and evolution as a manager and, you know, the ability to make adjustments, which is important in baseball and is important for anybody in a leadership role. Um, you know, one of the things we all talked about was, you know, um, you know, take your starting pitchers and, uh, you know, how deep you let them go into the games. And, you know, we had talked collectively about being conservative without early in the season, especially without, you know, an ordinary spring training to stretch these guys out. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanted to be careful with that. But as the season went on, you saw him extending pitchers more um, and giving those starting pitchers a chance to, you know, end innings as opposed to going to the bullpen to get the last out of an inning. And, 
you know, I, I think that is what builds credibility and trust with players as well, showing a willingness to make adjustments. We saw a lot of that. So thought he did a tremendous job and, and really excited to have him as our manager. Okay, next uh, season ticket holder, say season ticket member question from Lauren Kurtz, Field Club 108. And Christopher Mitchell also asked a similar question up uh, in 211. Uh, have you guys heard anything from MLB on DH, expanded playoffs, roster size, some of the changes we saw this last year and whether they might carry over? Have we heard anything about that? DH. Um, we, we have. Uh, Farhan and I were on a call I think, last week with the commissioner's office. Uh, I think they're in the process of canvassing all the clubs to um, – gauge interest in, you know, maintaining some of the, the new rules from 2020 and, and incorporating them into a, a new CBA or, or the 2021 season or both. Um, I personally liked some of the new rules. Um, I thought it, it created uh, certainly a more efficient uh, extra innings format for us. Um, you know, and, and you guys see it on the road all the time. Um, those 16 inning games on the road, right. Night game before day game um, are just a killer, not for, for that night only, but for the next week, week and a half, I mean, your, your bullpen is still struggling. Your guys are hanging. You're, you're trying to, you know, get uh, a call up from Sacramento on a flight immediately across the country to try to, you know, get some innings to get through the, the day game the next day. And so, um, I think there, there's something there. I'm not sure that that is the optimal format for, for extra innings, but I would be supportive of some sort of change that limits the length of, of games um, in, in the future. And uh, my own personal opinion on the DH is, is it's just much easier to build a team with a DH. And so uh, out of pure self-interest, I would be supportive of a DH moving forward. I mean, it'd be Ron, nice if they told great. you, right? It'd be nice if they told you what was going to happen, though, when <laughs> right. you're trying to build a team right now. Right. <laughs> it does. I, I have to imagine, it, especially the DH rule, uh, is a challenge for you guys to figure out what players to target and well, even your own talent. How do guys fit in? Uh, how the roster gets put together? If you if you still don't know. Yeah, I mean, you you look at our, our roster this year, and um, you know we had the opportunity to get you know certain bats into the lineup a lot more because of the DH position. You look at a guy like Darren Ruff who had a terrific year for us, um, and without the DH, not sure he gets that opportunity. You know, Wilmer Flores, who did such a wonderful job for us, um, you know, really uh, was playing almost every day for the first time in his career. He's kind of been more of a four day a week type guy, and and that gave him the ability to do that. But um, you know, I, I think the uh, you know, theme for us from a roster construction standpoint and really from an industry standpoint is going to be flexibility because we're all dealing with uncertainty. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we brought uh, Darren Ruff back uh, at the tender deadline yesterday was just knowing how impactful he can be, not just if we have the DH, but, you know, even if we don't as a bat off the bench, as somebody who can fill in at first base. Um, and so that that's really been a theme of ours the last couple of years, just building roster depth and flexibility. And it's going to be the same theme this off season. Great. Uh, Karen Green, a Gotham club member asked, uh, since you already referenced it, Barhan, what, what is going on with these winter meetings? It is they're all virtual. Nobody's getting together. How does that work? Are moves going to be made? Are we going to see, you know, usually that those few days we're like refreshing the MLB page to see, you know, if they're signings or deals or whatever, is any, is that going to happen? What do we think? Hey, uh, well, we finally got stumped. Neither of us is. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, the meetings are happening virtually and, and, you know, it, it's sinking. Well, what we talked about sort of the tender deadline, you've got the rule four five draft next week. And so I think we're just going to get a lot of free agent and trade activity. Um, because of the timing with the calendar. Now, we're not going to get, you know, the reports from the, the lobby uh, that, you know, fill up a lot of airtime and, and get people excited and talking. And, you know, I think we'll miss the chance to see, you know, our, our, our friends and colleagues with other teams in person uh, to be able to spend time with, you know, the great people we have at our minor league affiliates. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll still be, we'll still be churning away at home and, you know, on, on all the wonderful Zoom calls we get to be on these days. I could also yeah, add that so uh, wonderful. 
I was personally excited um, by some of the names that uh, were non-tendered last night. And so there was an influx of, of free agents. So obviously I got on the phone and started calling agents last night. And uh, one of the agents called me back this morning and said, you called me at midnight last night. Do you, do you ever sleep? And I, uh, I responded and told him it's almost winter meeting. So, I mean, it, calling someone past midnight is totally reasonable for this industry at this time of year. And, and he said his wife didn't really appreciate it. So I guess I should, uh, realize that things are changing and we're going virtual and I can't call, call agents that late anymore. So, so all of those players who yesterday were sort of let go. So they're free they're It's free reign on calling them, signing them. They could be signed today. huh? There's no restrictions. Right. Okay. Mike, uh, Dwayne, John, you want to, before I get a last uh, season ticket member question in, you guys want to jump in with anything else? I'm good. They've just fascinated me for this half an hour. So I'm happy as can be. <laughs> you look fascinated. Good, good job, Farhan. Good job, Scott. Way to go. Thank you. <laughs> We're good. Mike, John, you have it. You, John, you got anything else yeah. before I ask I mean, the last uh, question uh, or two? Are they, are they, is there in the pipeline sort of, through back channels, any word on whether the DH might come in this year? So that maybe teams have at least a, a good idea whether they sh should sign a guy or go for a guy that would probably be a DH if you if you pick them up. I mean, because that, that's happening right now. It's the player's interest for that to be known, and especially in in the, the GMs and the uh, baseball ops people in their interest, everybody's interest to know about that right now. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been told, um, you know, to plan as if we're not going to have it. And again, it was really something that was just put in place for um, 2020, given, uh, you know, the unusual nature of the season. So, um, you know, we weren't planning for a DH in 2020, and we actually wound up getting pretty good uh, production out of the position. So I think the, the plan will be the same. Hopefully we'll, we're ready with it, but we're planning and I think we're assuming it's not going to be in play. So uh, at least for one more year, we may be back to old style NL baseball. And but John, if you have any back channels, oh. let us know. All right. <laughs> if I hear anything, <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. I think you've <laughs> exposed <laughs> our back channels, aren't that John? So yeah, that's true. Now uh, my back channel is usually somebody on Twitter, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the other part was, and we talked about this at the, at the end of last year on, on the post game show together, all the broadcasters, but you know, the ball seemed to carry well. The, the dimensions are a little bit shallower in center field, right center, left center. Uh, but also without the wind coming in through the, the big wall in right field, uh, there was a thought that maybe the ball carried a little bit better and without getting knocked down by that wind. So there was a, a, a conversation about whether you would just in, lock it in that that would be the, the new way in the ballpark or will those archways be opened up when the fans come back? and uh, allow that wind to come through again. Has any determination been made on that aspect of it? Have you guys been able to study any of that sort of thing to, to determine what the effects actually were in terms of the dimensions and the lack of those winds last year? Yeah, well, we're crediting our, our, our players' raw power and, and great sort of uh, work ethic with uh, the improved offensive production. So we're... Uh, uh, we're thinking whether those archways are covered or not, we're going to have a good offense next year. But I know that's under consideration. It was another thing that was an unusual circumstance this year. You know, the dimensions, we, we definitely, you know, took a look and, you know, I think it was something like five to eight homers, both for us and for the road teams that we don't think would have been homers uh, in, in past seasons. So that was an interesting look at, and that was specific to the dimensions, but um you know, it, it certainly it certainly felt like uh, the ball was flying out of the ballpark at, in a way that we hadn't seen before. But again, I, I, in all seriousness, I think it is also a tribute to our players. They swung the bats really well this year. I mean, I, you guys don't leave a lot to chance. I mean, I know you do. You 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 like to find things out for certain. How do you find? How do you figure that out? How do you decide? I mean, you you do give a lot of credit to your players, but can you? Is there a way to actually determine, hey, what effect did this have? Yeah, we're going to take BP out there tomorrow and see if we can <laughs> hit it into the cove. And if we can, then definitely the dimensions will change. Yes. And the, then yes. The ball flight, but, yeah, you know what, though? In, in the 30 flight. home games that we had in the 60-game schedule, now I don't know this for a fact, but in watching it all these years, 
I would be willing to bet there were as many home runs hit by right-handed hitters to right field in 30 games that we normally see in 80 games. And that's how much different it felt to us watching it. We saw the very first home run that Chad Pender hit against the, the Giants in that two-game exhibition with the A's to right field. You don't see that. And then, you know, we said that every time a ball got hit out, well, that doesn't normally go out. So I would like to find that out. I mean, I know there's, it would be a piece of information that we could find out uh, just how many home runs um, are normally hit to right field by right-handed hitters and how many were hit this year in those 30 games. I think that would be quite interesting. We can find that out. I know we can. Can we do it in the uh, next half hour? <laughs> maybe not, but we can definitely okay. find that out. All right. All right. Our next, uh, our next chalk talk. All right. Before we let you guys go, I did want to give uh a couple of them. there are so many questions and a lot of them are similar, but there are several people, Fred uh, Collignan from Viewbox 310, one of them, a few others, uh, Karen Hilliard from 317. Minor leagues, there are some changes right now in terms of how leagues are being lined up. Do we expect to have minor league baseball in 2021? Is everybody planning like we're going to have minor league games? And then the system is going to look any different. Do you all have any insight into what that part of the organization is going to look like? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that unfortunately is is still up in the air. Um, it's going to be a function of us figuring out, you know, the right protocols and, and being able to safely play minor league baseball. Um, but I think the hope and expectation right now is is, is that we're able to play. Um, as for our affiliates, that's still being finalized. Obviously, it's great for us to have a couple of local affiliates here in the Bay Area, um, in uh, Sacramento and San Jose, and those will certainly continue to be Giants affiliates. And I think we'll have our full lineup ready to be announced soon. But uh, again, with all the guys we had in Instructs that um, really excited our staff and, and the entire organization, you know, certainly hoping we can get those guys back out into the minor league ballparks next year. Great. Well, I, I'll let John and Mike and Dwayne say goodbye themselves, but I do want to say on the record here with our fans watching, I mean, I think you guys deserve a lot of credit for, I mean, it should make Giants fans excited about the moves that you still have to make leading into 2021, because so far, I mean, between Yaz and Solano and Dickerson and Gosman and Smiley, and I mean, there are others, I'm leaving some out, There's a lot of good players that have been brought into this organization in the last year that made the Giants a better team and the coaching staff I think has been terrific so uh, I personally am excited for whether it happens in the winter meetings and we get a first big Giants move to announce or whenever it happens I'm, I'm excited to see what is uh, to come leading into this next year so congratulations from me to you two yep Thank totally you. agree I'm in on that we all feel the same way you guys we feel we're in good hands thank yep. you absolutely absolutely great Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great to see everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, yeah, guys. great to Happy see holidays, you. Happy holidays, guys. Yeah. Happy holidays. Let's see if we can get Gabe Kapler, the Giants manager, on here too. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean that. I mean, I'm not just saying that. I, I no. the track record of the, the track record of those two. I mean, Darren Ruff, we mentioned uh, the track record of those two finding talented players who could fit in this organization is pretty darn good. I mean, nobody. Nobody hits a thousand in those jobs, but uh, those guys are those guys have a pretty high batting average. Gabe Kapler, Giants manager, great to see you, Gabe. Dave, great to see you. Dwayne, John, Mike, everyone. Hey, Gabe. Hey, Welcome. Gabe. How's it going, John? John, since you did the uh, Gabe Kapler shows via Zoom all year long, do you and Gabe just want to have a show like a you know like a practice off season show here now? I mean, it was it was wild, and and I really appreciate. It. I don't know that fans really understood what was going on because uh, we were separated from the team. We were only in our booths. We weren't even with each other. We were separated in in, in different booths up there. Uh, we could see each other through windows and whatnot. Uh, and then uh, you were down in the clubhouse, and uh, and you took the time in in your busy day, all the different things you're going, doing, getting ready for a ball game. But uh, you did a Zoom thing every day with all of the broadcasters, as well as all of the writers, a separate one. 
to answer questions, uh, give us some background information, some things, anecdotes, uh, uh, injuries, anything that really helped us big time uh, on, uh, on our broadcast. But uh, and then we had the Gabe Kapler show to do as well. So uh, so that was kind of wild. And, and I, I really appreciated it, uh, all the things that, that, that you made time for and accommodated in what was really a, a, a weird season. So uh, and congratulations to you. I thought uh, things went went really well in, in, in that season. And uh, we're, we're actually hoping to be able to talk to you and get some of that information in person this year. What do you think? Oh, I, I love that idea. And first of all, John, obviously it was a, it was an honor to work with you. So I uh, really enjoyed that every day. And you mentioned, I got to do those, uh, do those interviews, uh, the show from my office. And I always felt privileged to be in my office with, with all the fans on this <laughs> zoom call, not being able to be at the ballpark. So it kind of felt that privilege, but it was always fun to watch your background. There was always an ocean. <laughs> there was always <laughs> something beautiful behind you to look at. And I, I got to be honest with you, John, most of the time we had our conversations, I was, I was pretty envious of, of uh, where you were doing those calls from. So it was, it was cool. Anyways, I, I really did enjoy it. So thanks for having me. John always what does you, what, a good backdrop. If, if, they, if they talk to you and ask your opinion about what should we do at the ballpark? Because we, we talked about this last year. Uh, I think uh, Mike Kruko was one of the first guys to bring it up, that the, those archways were going to be closed off for the first time in 20 years in this ballpark where that wind would funnel through and knock balls down to right field, which always made it more of a pitcher's ballpark. Uh, the dimensions were shallower. There were, there were more home runs because of that. But there was some thought that maybe the ball was carrying a lot better, especially to right and right center. Uh, without that wind coming in. So there was a, there was a, a thought that, well, maybe they'll make that permanent to, to just keep those uh, somehow shut and, and keep that wind from funneling through there. What would be your opinion if they said to you, Gabe, what do you think we should do? <laughs> well, I, I, heard, uh, I heard Farhan uh, kind of speak to the, the player development aspect of this. And um, I know that there were, were other considerations. It was warmer and the ball seemed to be moving out of the ballpark more, more often. Um, certainly as a player coming to, to Oracle myself, it always felt like it didn't matter how hard you hit the ball to the middle of the field, it was going to somehow die out there. So we did see a lot of balls go out of the ballpark and, and in particular to the middle of the field. But I also thought our players did a really nice job of um, when they hit the ball hardest, it, it seemed to be in the air on a, on a high line drive trajectory, not all the time, but a guy like Donovan Solano uh, comes to mind for me immediately. He does such a nice job of, of getting to that high line drive trajectory. And it works out really well for him because when he hits it on a line, on a low line drive, it tends to fall in front of the outfielders and he's just got enough juice where when he really gets into a ball and he puts it in the air uh, under today's conditions, uh, he can hit the ball out of the ballpark as well. So I liked it just the way it was. I thought our offense did a tremendous job. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd like to see it repeat itself and, and us to improve on the work that we did in 2020. Mike, you want to jump in? Well, I, I want to ask you a question about uh, your son. We had a conversation today, and this is completely away from baseball right now, but I think people are concerned and, and are thinking about what, what, what is the skipper doing in the off season? Well, you and your son are coming up to Tahoe. You're going to snowboard. And uh, your son is an extreme snowboarder. Uh, what's it like having a kid that likes to do things in an extreme way? Uh, it makes me insecure on a snowboard. <laughs> That's the first thing it does. Um, he's, he's excellent on, on the mountain. And yeah, we're going to come up to Tahoe uh, around Christmas for the first time. Um, as, as a kid or as kids, both of my sons, we went to Mammoth. Um, that was our, our spot. And, and we always heard about Tahoe, how much more beautiful it was and how expansive it was. And so my son, Dane, the one who I'm going to come snowboarding in, um, in late December, just drove up through San Francisco and into Washington State. But he, he swung around and, and hit Tahoe and did some hiking. He sent me some pictures of Tahoe that were absolutely breathtaking. Um, and I really can't wait to get up there with him and get on the slopes because it's been a long time coming for us to to do something like that together. So we're all really looking forward to it. And, and I appreciate you asking about that, Mike. And maybe, maybe socially distanced, you can go say hi to Mike while you're up there. 
Well, it sounds like there's a lot of, of Giants folks that are going to be up and around Tahoe and like Mike's in Reno, obviously. And I actually asked him via text a little bit earlier in the day if anybody ever stays in Reno. I didn't ask this specifically, but this is where I was going with it. Does anybody stay in Reno and drive to Tahoe like for the for the day? Uh, so it sounds like it's about 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour. And I think that's kind of doable. So I considered that. I considered staying in Truckee. But I'm open for um, for any suggestions about where the best places to stay are and Tahoe to get to the slopes easily, but also just to enjoy the experience. Mike has a master suite <laughs> off. Mike has a master suite <laughs> off the kitchen. Oh, is that right? Hello, yeah, yeah. I've, I've stayed there. It's unbelievable. He's a great cook. It's uh, you're in steaks, steaks, and you're scotch, in. scotch with with Mike and uh, and my son. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> And that would happen. Sounds, that would yeah. totally happen. sounds pretty Not darn fair. pretty darn good. Hey, Gabe, let me ask you because we I, you were I know you were listening with uh, Farhan and Scott. We have so many of these uh, season ticket uh, member questions. Let me start off with one from Dan Dominguez, who's a uh, club level season ticket holder. Uh, Giants made strides hiring a woman coach, Alyssa Nacken, and we, we you know one of the great misses for us this year was not getting to know better all of the new coaches that are part of your staff who clearly did such a great job. Everybody raved about Alyssa's fit with the staff, with the players, with everybody. Do you think her success is going to lead to seeing more women get opportunities in the game, whether it's in our organization or across baseball? I do. Um, I think it was, it was important for us to demonstrate that um, not only could she stand on on even ground with all of our other coaches, but in a lot of ways, she just excelled past any of our expectations. And so her success um, was really exciting. It made me, when we just hired our assistant pitching coach, JP Martinez from the Twins, um, it, it made us bring some women into that pool um, for consideration for our assistant pitching coach position. There was one that was, was really interesting to me, a woman that I'd worked with in, in Philadelphia. It turns out she wasn't accessible and it wasn't quite the right time and, and the right fit. Um, but certainly every time we have an open spot on our staff, we're going to be thinking about and considering uh, the great women around the game of baseball, but also outside the industry and seeing if they can fill those roles successfully, successfully for us. Um, I, I think that is in an effort to be as diverse as possible, but also because I think it's just going to make us better. Um, we have an open mental skills coach uh, position right now, and we're, we're actively um, searching for, for candidates. We have a nice pool of candidates, and, and um, we're going to have um, a great number of, of really smart, really capable women um, vying for, for that position as well. Every time we have that opportunity, we're going to seek to to include as diverse a pool as possible of candidates. And since you brought up his name, Gabe, tell us a little bit about, I mean, I, I don't know that much about our new uh, assistant pitching coach, JP Martinez. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, sure. Um, first he's, he's a, uh, he's an excellent Spanish speaker. That was an important part. Um, one of the things that um, we wanted to account for was the fact that while Ethan Katz was an excellent uh, assistant pitching coach to Bales and, and our entire staff, um, that was one blind spot we had. We have Brian Bannister, Brian Bannister, who is our pitching director, Andrew Bailey, not a Spanish speaker, Ethan Katz, who wasn't a, a Spanish speaker, um, and Craig Alburn, as our bullpen coach, was not a Spanish speaker. But as we all know, we had Spanish speakers on our pitching, pitching staff, something that we wanted to, to definitely seek out. So that's one big plus for JP. Independent of that, he's an excellent communicator, um, really smart guy, the ability to um, bring both data and a really good feel for the game to the dugout and, and to the clubhouse comes highly recommended from the people that I know in Minnesota. Um, we ran a very collaborative process and everybody really liked JP and thought he was a good fit for our staff. Kai, if you want to jump in? Yeah, this is, I want to go back to the DH. Uh, this is kind of like a two part question. Uh, my opinion, I really thought the DH helped the giants this year. Yeah. And I'm not a and I'm not really a DH guy. Uh, but you managed in Philadelphia no DH. You managed this year 60 games with a DH. Did you find that there is a big difference in managing? Yeah, no, there there really is, Dwayne. I mean, it, it 
it, it changes the way you think about a, a starting pitcher for sure, uh, because you're just thinking about um, getting to your bullpen in isolation without thinking about the value of actually hitting for, for that pitcher. Um, and there were so many times when at the bottom of the lineup, we might have op- had an opportunity to score runs if there was a pitcher in that lineup spot and hit, hit, him for, hit for him a, a little bit earlier than we might have otherwise. So it just introduces um, not having a DH introduces a little bit more uh, complexity to all of all of the decisions in the dugout. I, I love not having the DH. I, I think it's a fun part of National League Baseball. That said, um, it, it does make the game a little bit easier to manage. You're making you, you're considering fewer things as you're making your decisions. Yeah. Plus, you have to. Without the DH, you you really have to make your you have to make your make sure your bench is put together in a different kind of a way. No doubt, because you're going to double switch so much. No, no doubt, right? And it, and you know your pinch hitter, if if you are planning on on double switching and you have a lead, uh, you want to feel comfortable that you're going to insert that player into a defensive role where he makes you better and not worse. So, yeah, that's a that's a really important consideration. You're right. You know, while we're on that, because uh, Bob Biddle, uh, a season ticket holder from 315, asked about the DH. Jerome Lerman from 318 asked about the extra inning rule that we saw this year. Scott talked about it a little bit a few minutes ago. What did you think about that rule? I thought it was fun. Um, I, I thought it made the game interesting and enjoyable when you got into extra innings. Um, so, you know, the one thing I would say is while I think we look back on the 17, 18 inning game and think of it fondly when you're actually at the ballpark, whether as a fan or as a manager or as a player, it's kind of like you want to get, you want to win the game desperately but you want to also have the game be over so that everybody's not wrecked tired coming to the ballpark the next day. Now fans as well, like they have kids and like people have to get home. So um, the the really, really long drawn out extra inning game, I'm not sure how good it is for baseball. Uh, I'm not sure how many players are fans of it. And, and I think it was a a decent solution that major league baseball came up with. I mean, I, I, nobody asked me, but I do have to say, I mean, I didn't know what to think of it, but I actually, I actually looked forward to when, when a game was in the ninth inning and it was tied, I was sort of hoping that it would go to the 10th inning just because it, it, it created some scenarios that were fun. I mean, I, there, it, it was an instant sort of drama and something different. And I don't know, maybe that would wear off over time, but Dave, I liked it let way me, more than I thought I would. Dave, let me ask you this. When you put that guy on at second base in your scorecard, what did you yeah. write down? <laughs> I, so I went to the, to the next to the box where – so I moved up an inning, but then I went up a hitter to the guy who made the last out, right. and I just, drew the, I just drew the line to second base. That's all I did. You did. So I, I kept it three, simple. I yeah. put three X's, and I don't know why. Just like – just triple to, X. That's so your it. eye would go there. Yeah. 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 We figured it out. That was, yeah. I, that was a small, uh, you know what? The only thing we made, the only thing maybe that I would tweak it is maybe play the 10th. One more inning and then go to the 11th. And, 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 and cause I, I thought it was great. I, I did. Uh, but maybe I would go one extra inning. I, I was going to ask the first you time, the How first time we had it didn't call go that well. No. No. The first, the first one wasn't that fun. No, after that, that was no, pretty no. fun. After that, it was good. <laughs> Gabe, what were you saying? I think the first one wasn't wasn't the first one. Gabe Rogers, uh, you know, because Tyler ended up having a great <laughs> yeah. year, but he yeah. had a couple stumbles. I think the first one was not good for him. Yeah, it was a disaster. That 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 might be right. No, I was just going to ask you guys, like, how do you feel about calling games that that end in you know in the fourteenth, the fifteenth, the sixteenth inning? Like, are you are you itching to get home? Like, what's your what's your take on it? Uh, John, what do you? Uh, John, please take <laughs> that one, would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I and I even in the postseason last year, they were they went back to the just normal. If you went extra innings, then you played extra innings. And what happened to uh, who was it? Cincinnati and 
and Atlanta. Atlanta. Did they play? Eight, yep. Did they play 18, 17, 18? I mean, they just went on, and nobody ever got on base. It seemed like what well, Cincinnati got four hits in the whole game. Yeah. Uh, and I kept thinking, well, just put a guy at second for God's sakes. But I got third. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the next adjustment. Run I, uh, on third base, nobody out. <laughs> I, I think the, uh, you know, sometimes when you're doing it, 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 it turns the whole thing into a, it's like you're not even doing a ball game anymore. It's like you're doing a, the, the, you know, the Democratic National Convention or something. You're just, you got there at, at noon, you went on the air until two o'clock in the morning. That's just the way it's going to be. But, uh, uh, so uh, you, were, you were anchoring something, something that wasn't just, just a baseball game. It was some kind of an epic kind of a thing. But uh, anyway, whatever they, whatever they do, our job, we, we just broadcast it. So uh, uh, if that's the new rule. Uh, and and I, I think it's not just a question of maybe preference and what we all enjoy or, uh, or, or even a question in my mind of, uh, you know, a bullpen gets beat up and maybe it's a week, a week and a half before everything gets straightened out again. You have so many tired arms out there and you have a day game coming up after your, your 18 inning game and all that. But for me, the real question is the guys can get hurt. There, there are, and, and probably a lot of guys got hurt in those really long games. Guys went deeper into those games than they would have having worked the day before. I, I, I remember doing one of those games in that uh, 04 when the Red Sox came from three games to nothing and won four straight games. The first game was extra innings. And Keith Folk was their closer, a guy who was pitching one inning a day. You were there. You were, you were an outfielder for the Red Sox at that time. And, and he pitched, what, I don't know, three and two-thirds innings in that game. And then later on that same day, he played another extra inning game. Uh, Big Poppy got a, a, a hit to, to, and a walk-off in both games as the Red Sox won. But Folk pitched another two or three innings. And I don't know that Keith Folk was ever the same again as for, the, no, for the rest of his right. career. You're right. He was he was never as good as he was in 04. And, and I do think there is um, the next year you kind of feel the, the impact – of how much you worked in the previous year. There's, there's no question. That makes a lot of sense. It's a great way to ruin your arm, though. And you know what? I, I like the new rule, but I tell you, one of the greatest things that the four of us ever were ever a part of, and it, we almost froze to death, was the 18-inning game in 2014 <laughs> against the Washington Nationals when the Giants won that game on the road. It was incredibly exciting. And it's almost a badge of courage when you persevere not only as a player or, or a coach or a manager, but as a broadcaster. But you look back and you know what? You were proud to be part of that story because it was that incredible. So I've got mixed emotions about it, but I, I thought it was very interesting. I like Kipe's idea about tweaking it just a little bit, carrying 10 regular innings and uh, and then going on to the, to the format. Because I, I, I do fear about the, the, the health of a bullpen. And can, can I ask yeah. a question here? I mean, this is kind of – You can. It's been bugging me since game six of the World Series. And Gabe, I got to ask you, we're sitting here watching Blake Snell school the Dodgers. Yeah. And against Mookie Betts and Corey Seager and Justin Turner, their first six at bats, he struck them out six times. Yeah. And he gets pulled out of that game in the, in the sixth inning. I want to know what your feelings were about watching that as a manager. Yeah, I, I, would, I would have left Snell in the game. So I, I want to actually answer this two ways. I think you're right. Um, I think sometimes, you know, you really have to get locked into to the feel of the game. And Snell was dominating. I think everybody knew that. Um, the one thing I want to say just in defense of Cash, and, 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 and if Kevin was sitting right here, I'd say the same thing, that, that I would have left him in the game. But I think he does his homework. Um, that's the way he had been treating Snell um, the entire year. And he made it very clear to his pitchers throughout that he was going to go to his very, very dominant pen um, early and he was going to do it often and he did it throughout the playoffs and he did a pretty nice job of getting his club to that point. So I commend him for kind of setting, setting his boundaries, setting his tone and going after it with his style. But, you know, as, as a fan of the game, as somebody who was watching it in real time, I would have left Snell in there. Hey, do you think, Gabe, that that's what kind of – gave Theo Epstein the the comment of we have to change baseball a little bit and go back to some of the little things after what we saw in the World Series? 
Yeah. So, you know, the way I've been thinking about it recently, Kype, is, is like the, the levels on a mixing board, right? I, I think you want to use a lot of data and, and um, as much information as possible. But I just think sometimes we get, we turn up that, that dial too much and then it becomes a little bit artificial and you kind of lose the feel of the game and, and the intuition that we all have as, as baseball people. And so I, I don't think we have to, you know, turn the dial all the way back down, but I do think there, there's kind of a middle ground somewhere in there that, that we can get to. Yeah. But didn't you think it was interesting that he would come out and say that? I do, you know, particularly because Theo, I mean, he was, um, he was a general manager of, of the Red Sox teams that I was on. Uh, right. that John just alluded to in 2003 through 2006. And I mean, he was as, as analytical as, as they come. And he was, right. you know, pu- he was pushing the envelope. He was as, he was as edgy a- as they, as they came. Um, but he's also a, a thoughtful leader that's willing to come off of his positions. And I think in his comments, that's basically what he was saying is, you know, there's, there's a time to maybe turn the dial back down just a, just a tad. Yeah, I think a good uh, follow-up, Gabe, from Scott Gardner, who's in uh, club level 224. He was asking about your approach to the bullpen. I don't, you know, he, he calls it closer by committee. I'm not sure mm-hmm. it was entirely that the whole year, but uh, you tried out a bunch of different options. You've had a chance to sit back. I mean, this wasn't your first year as a manager, but you've, you've reflected on how last year went. Do you have any thoughts on managing a bullpen in general, how you did it this past year, the way you might do it going forward? Yeah, sure. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, it, it, it's it's on the pitchers. We are asking them to step up and, and take control of roles and make it unequivocally clear that, that they are the right man for the job. I was on that Red Sox team that John talked about. Keith Folk was the clear closer. There was no question marks. He was always the guy. But that's because Keith Folk had an awesome changeup, threw a ton of strikes, struck dudes out, and got weak contact. Um, I, on the flip side of the coin, I think about the Rays. I think they used 11 plus pitchers to save games in, in 2020. They did that because they had a lot of guys who were capable, but also probably because one person didn't emerge as, as the surefire guy to close games. Now, I don't think, my personal opinion, that the 2020 Giants had somebody step up and say, I am going to be the closer. So we had several pitchers pitch the ninth inning and the eighth inning and the seventh inning and we gave them all a chance to step up. Now that's not to say going forward that we won't have an opportunity to have to name a closer and to say that, you know, every time we have a lead in the ninth inning, we're going to hand to hand the ball to this one pitcher. We have a couple of potential options of guys who might be able to do that. Uh, Scott mentioned earlier on the call that we're going to have Moranta coming back. Andrew Bailey, our pitching coach, and I just had a, a really important heart to heart with Maranta. Um, on Zoom, of course, he was in the Dominican Republic, where we challenged him to come to camp in his peak physical condition. We challenged him to come to camp, um, dedicating himself to potentially being a, an important late inning, high leverage reliever for us. And he's going to have opportunities to take control of a role like that. We'll see what he looks like in spring training. Um, and, and if he steps up to the plate and emerges as that guy, then we're going to be really excited about it. You know, I I think sometimes um, it seems like I'm trying or we're trying to not name a closer. It's quite the opposite. We're, we're waiting for somebody to step up and, and take the reins. Yeah. Good answer. Uh, Well, I, you know, as we wrap up with you, Gabe, I just want to say, you know, echo what John and the guys were saying earlier. We really, we missed being there in person with you this year, but uh, I commend you on the way that you had, I think Farhan and Scott would be okay with me saying that it probably wasn't the easiest team to manage that they handed you at the start of the year. And I do think you did a terrific job uh, making a lot of, you had to make a lot of decisions every day about who's in the lineup, who's not in the lineup, who's the DH, who's hitting when, when am I pinch hitting starting pitchers? When am I taking those guys out? And uh, I thought you did a terrific job. So I hope you've been able to reflect on, the way that last season went in a positive way over these last couple months. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate it. And um, I know that before I hopped on, you guys were, everybody was kind of asking each other, are you over it yet? And uh, have you, 
have, have you finished your therapy sessions? I'm wondering like if, if you might be open for some therapy sessions with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite there yet. I, 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 still need a little, I still need a little work. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I think, we, I think we accomplished some good things this year. I'm really excited about 2020 and really glad to be here with, with some of our fans tonight. That's what the scotch in Mike's kitchen is going to be about in Reno when you're there in a few weeks. I, I, That'll be just, your therapy session. We're, we're just going to crash Mike's place. We're just going to show up and start banging on the door. He's got a little bit of scotch. He does. It's unbelievable. <laughs> 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 Plus, Gabe, can you play a musical instrument? I, I can play several, but I play them all really poorly. So, Well, Mike has got every instrument possible in that house. So while you're drinking your scotch, you'll be playing an instrument and singing as well. That's Ooh, just the way it is. That sounds like a lot of oh, fun. There they he's, are. He's giving you a little tour. There's a few. I saw just three guitars. What's what's that on the table? It's a harmonica. Uh, that's a uh, <laughs> mandolin and a ukulele. Oh, wow. That's cool. You got this uh, <clears throat> octave mandolin that has a uh, giant logo on it. It's kind of cool. Oh, that's awesome. But uh, yeah, so when you get up here, make sure you bring your picks. Yeah, no Airbnb for you. It's Mike Kruko's house. Perfect. <laughs> Mike, I didn't realize how much we have in common. I think uh, I think we're gonna get along just fine. Yeah, you are. I, we'll find that really out next year true. without masks. It's gonna happen. Can't wait. Gabe, Thanks. have a great holiday. Thanks, Thanks Gabe. for being with us. Thanks, Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Gabe. guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, really. Merry fun. Christmas. Well, guys, what do good we job, think? Dave. Did, Good job. Okay, you went away. I did not. We're, 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 oh, you didn't? I did oh, not. I, don't I thought, think I did. I thought as soon as I... Gabe left, Kipe signed off. Your video went away. Well, that's good. That's a good yeah. thing. <laughs> Do you know what was really good? We got a chance to tell those guys how we feel and how Giants fans feel. And we all feel like we're in good hands. And it's, it's important because, you know, they've come a long way in a short time. And, uh, and I can't wait for spring training. I can't wait for this next four weeks as to how they're going to shape up that roster that comes into spring training. And uh, it's exciting. It is. I wish yeah, we all could have been there listening to Pat Brill talk about all those kids. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the one thing I was going to finish this on. It, it, when, when Pat Brill says something positive, uh, I think we all have to, to, to stand up and listen. And he just didn't talk about hitters, as Mike said. He was just going on and on about four or five guys that he said can help the Giants right now, and they're all young. And uh, so, you know, look, I, I, I took notice, and now I, I can't wait. I really can. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a good teaser for 2021. Yeah, uh, and what – is there any – any insight? Have we heard anything at all? Because I know we don't know if we're going to start on time. We don't know if spring training is going to be in Arizona. I mean, we won't know, I guess, until we get closer to it, uh, what, what, whatever's going on in, in Arizona and Florida with the, with the COVID and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, and, and, and if will we start the season on time? So th those are all sort of things that are still up in the air right now. And I know baseball has got some contingency plans. Uh, just in case we, we, we get a little delay. We heard Mike, you raised uh, your hand. We were heard. We heard that the front office was notified to prepare for a 120 game season. Then they were notified to pre pre prepare for a 142 game se season. And now they've been notified to, pre to prepare for 162. To me, that's good news. We have a chance to get a full season in. I don't know how much of spring training we're going to get, but I do think that 2001, we will see normalcy come back to the game. We will get our fans back. Good. All right. And, it, and it, it depends upon how many. But, hey, look, if it's 5, 10, 20, it's – look, I love the cutouts, but it's certainly better than cutouts. I was sick of the cutouts towards the end. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, well, the, problem with the, the problem with the cutouts is for where we were sitting doing the games, we couldn't see any of the cutouts. No, it was just. It looked like standing of, up on top of the hill at the Presidio Cemetery, looking down the hill. It yeah, looks like it looked like the back. <laughs> We're looking at tombstones. You're exactly right. Uh, <laughs> now, from the I, from the center field camera, it was awesome. 
And, yeah, and you guys good. probably felt the same way. The, the teams that didn't do cutouts, you could really notice that it didn't look the same. And, and it really wasn't as good. You know, I wanted to ask Gabe that. If he was standing there in the dugout when he looked up in the stands, if he saw any cute-looking cutouts, he would have given the answer. <laughs> he would have. He would have. Uh, well, and I, I'll, I'll say this. Like, because I know probably some of our fans, as we wrap this up, who are watching tonight, are, are nervous. I mean, people are, you know, when are we going to feel comfortable about coming back to the ballpark and being together, even if we start to get vaccinated? I mean, I do think that the Giants of – all organizations are going to take this. I mean, they're thinking hard now about how to make everybody as comfortable as possible, how to make the ballpark, the entry, getting in, getting out as comfortable as possible for everybody. So I know they're working on that stuff. Yes. Fauci is going to greet everybody at the stadium. As they come <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Hi, nice everybody. to meet you. Yep. We're glad you're here. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Uh, he doesn't know it yet but it's going to be a big job for him good job and if you guys good job by you last words if you guys are are looking for a gift idea are you having a hard time coming up with a gift okay the holiday priority pack oh giants fans get savings flexibility priority to purchase tickets for the 2021 season each priority pack includes four value vouchers to be applied toward a game ticket for the regular season, starting at just 45 bucks. sfgiants.com slash holiday. And that's an easy gift. Stay at Mike's place in Reno. It's going to be awesome. That, that's only an extra $99. <laughs> and you get that guest suite off the kitchen. <laughs> sfgiants.com oh, slash holiday. All together now. And he'll sing you to sleep at night. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> Oh, we'll all be there. Guys, great to see you. All right, guys. Great. Yeah, I miss we'll, you, we'll, Clowns. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. I don't know when we're do I don't know when we're doing another one, but I'm sure in the in the new year we'll be having another one of these for our fans. Absolutely. So, Good job, right. Dave. Great to see you. Happy holidays. All right. See you all happy soon. Happy holidays, guys. Same to you all. <laughs>